what made you choose a research career in academia? Um, basically, I started out in a diagnostic laboratory. Um, and as part of that, I just got interested in research. I think it's the fascination with research. Um, it's the understanding, the knowing, the finding out something that others don't know. Um, you're the first to discover that. And it's just a fascinating and really interesting thing to do. Okay, so what made you choose to work for a university rather than a company? I, I think a university has more of an academic focus and uh, we talk about academic freedom and there is uh, the, the possibility to pursue an area of interest or some situation, some focus that, that you want to, albeit within the confines of the faculty or the, or the school, and it gives you more freedom, basically. What is your achievement which you find most satisfying? I think if you're talking a research achievement, it would be, I worked on a protozoan parasite called Toxoplasma, and it would be to find out it's part of its life cycle and, and how it affects uh, humans. Um, and that, that's my, my research aspect of it. If my greatest, I guess, um, academic career uh, achievement, it would be to, to do things like this, to actually give some advice and guidance to early career researchers, but also to, to more senior researchers on how to plan and make their academic career as good as it can be. So how do you define early career researchers? Um, it, it tends to be one of two sorts of people. Um, the vast majority of early career researchers are people who are just about to complete their PhD or who have had their PhD for generally around about five to seven years. It's, it's a sort of a beginning researcher in, in academia. There are also a second grouping now of early career researchers, if you like, um, of people who have done exceptionally well in professional activities, uh, architects, uh, uh, business managers, uh, nurses and so on, who are being brought into the university environment, uh, albeit with high quality and high level professional qualifications, but not necessarily major research um, uh, findings or, or, or outcomes. And so they are a second group of early career researchers, although they may be certainly more older and senior, um, but they are now becoming more common uh, globally as people who are being brought into universities as well. When you were a young researcher, what was your most unforgettable challenge? I think it was probably how to spend my time, as in what to concentrate on. Um, when you're relatively young and eager and ambitious and there's so much to do, it's really a matter of uh, not only for research, but uh, do I do more teaching, do I do more administration, um, and even within research, which aspect do I chase, what do I, what do I focus on? And I think these days, and that's, that's part of the challenge in, a, in, a, in an early career researcher, is how you spend your time. And it's up to an individual largely to decide on how they spend their time. And I, I think mine clearly was, was very much focused on, on the research aspects of, the, of the, the parasite I was working on. Would your situation have been different if someone had given you this advice and guidance? I think um, uh, some people are just focused uh, and as a natural part of their personality. Um, and, and I think I'm probably like that. I'm, I'm a strategic planner and I like to, to think ahead. Um, others dwell more on the moment um, or on what they're doing now. Um, I certainly would have appreciated it uh, when I was younger and starting out, um, but to me it was sort of like just a given. And, and to many people it is. I think, however, these days in a much more competitive academic environment, the more information, the more guidance, the more assistance an early career researcher can get from any area, the better. So, what is the best advice someone gave you when you were an early career researcher? I think, again, it was to, to focus, um, at, but also on excellence. Um, I think it's important these days, and certainly in a much more competitive environment, to, as far as publishing goes and a range of other things, to actually try to be as your research productivity as excellent as it can be. Um, it's easy to, to, to publish in a, in a reasonable journal, but it takes a bit more time and effort to, to try and raise the standard in which you publish. And within limits and within time, I'd always suggest that a, a researcher aim for excellence.
as a young researcher, very often we need directions and guidance. So what is your advice in selecting a mentor or a supervisor? Well, I think uh, a mentor um, is someone who can give you free, honest, open advice and criticism. Um, they are probably your best um, academic friend. Um, and, and they don't really get a lot out of it. And, and for that reason, they are often difficult to find and not everybody has one. Um, some people have their mentor as their research supervisor. Uh, that's certainly a possibility, but it's not one that I would recommend and it's not one that's ideal because the research supervisor is so involved in your research that they may not be able to give you the sort of social or personal suggestion or advice uh, that may benefit you. I, I've not yet found too many research supervisors who recommended to their early career researchers that they stop working so hard or take a bit of a break or whatever. Um, if you can find a good mentor, um, particularly for women, for younger women who are sort of uh, in a competitive environment, uh, a more senior uh, woman with experience in a range of the research areas is invaluable. But again, um, if you can't do that, or your supervisor fills that role, then, then one should, should uh, take that advice. So what are the aspects that an early career researcher should consider in selecting uh, research collaborators? I think research collaborators, again, are extremely important. Often an early career researcher may not know where to go or how to form the relationship. Collaboration, we generally think, is a very good thing but it's good when it's working for you and it's synergistic. When you're getting something out of it and your collaborators are getting something out of it, it's a really good thing. But one should also determine when to stop collaboration, when to cease it, when to say the collaboration's worked well um, and now I'm going to collaborate with somebody else or it's been, it's been a good, productive, synergistic, leveraged relationship and now sort of we don't need to pursue it anymore because we're finished. Um, I think uh, certainly national, Collaboration, uh, international collaboration is highly regarded these days, but again, for an early career researcher, it needs to be done within the context of what one supervisor would want to do with the relationship and also how one goes about forming the relationship. How can an early career researcher best make use of new technology to stay in touch with the latest research in their field? Well, I think. The biggest challenge these days is the enormous amount of publication, the, the enormous amount, and of course it varies from, from area to area, science, technology, engineering and medicine to social science, humanities and so on, but there is an enormous, a global sort of output of research findings and technologies and so on. It really is a matter again of using the appropriate databases, of keeping up with the literature. I was an editor-in-chief of an international journal for a number of years, and many of the rejections that we had to bring about in the papers were because somebody had done the work or something very similar a few years before. And so the challenge is to be on top of the game, if you like, in trying to identify uh, the appropriate technologies, the current technologies, the ones that are going to work for you. And there are clearly a number of databases and so on, a lot of tools these days, certainly not, not available in my time, but a number of tools these days that all academics and, and especially early career researchers should be using. Yeah, so how can we determine what sources we need to go to to get to the right papers and uh, results? Well, I think again, um, the, the supervisor, one's research supervisor is very instrumental in this sort of thing. You, you, you take on as a, as a PhD student or as a young you know, postdoc or a PhD or an academic, you, you are in a network. You, you really are working on your own at that level. You, uh, social science and humanities tend to be more sort of sole author, but even then these days there are more teams being formed in those areas. Science, technology, engineering and medicine do it as a natural. We work in teams and you, you tend to learn through osmosis. Your supervisor will give you guidance and advice. Your mentor can, but there are also numerous positions in most universities uh, a, a person in the library, a person in the research office, a person in the graduate school and so on who can help you and give you advice. Most universities have a technology transfer office or a commercialisation office, whatever it's called. There are many areas in universities, many people in these areas who are set up 
to give you guidance and advice. You are a researcher. Your best time is spent doing research, not necessarily chasing up a number of these areas. So you, you, you use the available tools and, and, and expertise in the university to help you do that. What is your advice for early career researchers who are not native English speakers to publish in language perspective? Um, as a non-native English speaker, you may certainly in the early parts of your career be focused on local journals, even your university journals, and they tend to be, uh, in many countries, uh, the, the native language. I think uh, one, whichever you decide, um, needs to establish whether one is going to publish in the native language or in uh, an English language journal and then work for that. And it may be in the early parts of your career you do publish in, in, in your native language. And then as you progress, you may go to, to more uh, general international uh, English journals or you may swap and change and, and so on. I don't think it's uh, as important to do one or the other, but to decide what you want to do when. And you've got to make a decision on it because it is very important. Databases clearly are focused, not exclusively, but there is a bias in citations to English language papers. If someone were to decide that he or she would want to publish in English, then what would your uh, advice be to improve their uh, publication? Well, I guess it depends on the, the standard of their English at the start, but, and I know some universities have actually, uh, on their staff, English speakers or people who can help you with your English and I know some journals, some publishing companies actually have people who can actually help polish the English in your papers and so I would sort of make as much use of local um, English speakers but also pick journals or focus on journals or publishing companies that do provide these sort of services as well. So what are the criteria uh, we should consider when we are choosing a journal to publish in? I think there are a number of, of what I would call matrices and you've got to, to sort of bear those in mind as an early career researcher. I think the major one is you should work out who and before you start the work, the order of the authors, who's going to be an author and what their order is going to be because it's very important as an early career researcher to, to be involved, to do most of the work, and then all of a sudden find that one is second or third in a group of five. So it's important to, to author order is the first point. As far as picking the journal in which to publish your work, I think certainly the quality of the journal, there's no doubt. Uh, whether you use eigenfactor, impact factor, um, and a range of these sort of analyses, and I strongly recommend one does, whichever ones you pick, that's important. But it's also these days important to look at the exposure of the journal. And again, I would look at, is it in English or is it in my native language? Um, is it a society publication? If it's a society publication, then presumably it's going to get to a number of society members and already have a, a sort of um, network, if you like, of, of uh, readers. Um, will, it be, will it get a fair hearing? Um, there is biases in some areas and some countries towards papers that are published in that country. So if you're from another country, maybe you'd be better off looking at an area where your paper is going to get a fair hearing. Um, I think the other thing is time, time to publication. There are some of the highest journals in a range of disciplines, say economics, take actually two years to actually process and publish the journal or, or the, the, the paper. I would not send anything there. No matter how good the journal was, I would try and find one that, that, it, that processes the, the, the paper quicker. In my time, I think my quickest all-time rejection um, from a paper from North America was 20 minutes. And I actually got an email back after that. They thanked me for the quick rejection because they could send it somewhere else. There's nothing worse than actually having a paper out for 18 months or two years and not knowing what's happening with it. And as the first author, as an early career researcher, you need to build up your track record, ideally a quality one, but also based around some quantity, and having papers out for 18 months or two years, in my, in my opinion, is far too long. So I think it's really, it gets back to a range of things like author order, certainly the quality of the journal from a quantitative analysis, but also is it going to get a fair hearing? Um, do they normally publish papers in my area? But, but lastly, what's the speed of acceptance um, of, of the journal? I think those are very important. 
I would also pick a half a dozen journals and I would put them on my wall in my office and they are the ones I would focus on because you get known to the journal, you get a better chance therefore of the reviewers knowing your work um, and sooner or later they're going to send you as an early career researcher some of their papers for you to review so you're building up your track record and then all of a sudden somebody will write to you and say would you like to be on our editorial board okay so so again if you if you have 10 papers across 10 different journals that's le less likely to happen if you have 10 papers in two or three journals not all in the same one 10 papers in two or three journals you get known and I think you are you are making more of a, um, a profile for yourself and that's important for an early career researcher. When an early career researcher attends a conference, who are the key people he or she should try to get to know? I, I can't give you a specific name or a position, but I think it, your question is very important in that the early career researcher gets the agenda, gets the program as quickly and as early as they can and tries to identify the people that they want to see. Clearly, if they're thinking about a fellowship in another country, it wouldn't hurt to talk to people from, from that other country or other group. Um, also to find out who are the, the key speakers in the area in which they work. Um, the, the, the challenge is how do they actually um, sort of project themselves onto that person. Uh, if there's a group of 10 people, um, an early career researcher from another country is going to have potential trouble finding their way in to meet the major speaker. I think um, the, the, the question is a very good one because it actually talks about the planning for the conference and I think far too, too few people, even senior researchers, plan on what they're going to do at the conference. They don't get best value out of it. What, what ideally should happen is the early career researcher needs to plan who they're going to meet based on what criteria and clearly that, as I said there's a number of criteria um, and make sure that they even if they email the person first it's some of the conference these days have 5,000 people and it's extremely difficult to find somebody you, you, and these days you may not even get into the auditorium or the room where the speech is being there's a you know people sitting in the aisles and so on it's extremely difficult to meet that speaker and so on but by careful planning, preparation before you go to the conference, it makes your life a lot easier. And I strongly recommend people do that, and, and often they don't. When someone has met a couple of people at a conference, how should one make sure that you stay in touch with the people you have just met? I think that's a, another very important question, and I, I believe in a follow-up. You try and get their email, you swap business cards, um, you, you then say, um, I'm interested in your work, would you mind if I, if I corresponded? They might often say, yes, here's my e email, or they might give you one of their postdocs email, or depending on the sort of the person. Uh, and then you, you, and it, a week later, when you get home, you just drop them a quick line, thank you for your discussion, I found it interesting. And you try and, in an appropriate way, keep in contact with the person, without doubt. Uh, these days, you might get them to alert you when their publications come out, or to try and get some way to to keep in touch with those, those people. 90% of collaboration start in a face-to-face -face meeting, often at a conference. And so often good, good collaborations come out from that. Well, in the booklet you also mention the importance of saying no on certain occasions uh, when one gets offered a new position in a society, for example. So how can an early career researcher identify such occasions? It is, it's a very good question again, and it's a very difficult answer because the individual has to look at their own circumstance. It's a difficult question for me to answer. Hopefully it's not a difficult question for the early career researcher to answer. And it depends sometimes. There are situations where it's impossible, almost impossible for an early career researcher to say no. And, and I, would, I would recommend that an early career researcher seriously consider the potential consequences in saying, no, I don't want to do that teaching, or no, I don't want to do that admin, or no, I don't want to do that research. But the point I was making in the booklet is, by saying yes constantly and, and all the time, then in one is potentially not making the best use of your time by, by allocating your 25 hours in the day or 48 hours in the day to projects that may not be in your best benefit, that may not add synergy or leverage to the work you're doing. So it really is a matter again of, okay, what is my university going to get out of this? What is my faculty going to get out of this? And above all, what am I going to get out of it? 
I'm not trying to be sort of insular and, and very negative about it, but if it's not in the ECR's best interest, if they're not going to get something out of it that they think is worthwhile, then why are they doing it? And it's important, particularly early on, particularly in very competitive groups, that you actually stand up for yourself, if you like, in an appropriate way, in a sensitive way, but say, uh, no, I'd rather be doing this, or could I be doing this, or what about if I do this? Give the reasons, uh, substantiate it, and I think you'll be, you'll be respected, and your decision may probably be taken on board. It's, it's simply just not a matter of saying yes to everything, and then six months later finding you're just snowed under, and it becomes worse because you are potentially not doing your best for all the things you've said yes to, and that becomes a negative. Whatever you do, it's got to be what you want to do, ideally, and it's got to be worthwhile. So for an early career researcher, the research world can also be very intimidating. So how can an early career researcher make sure that their work stands out without exaggerating their own importance? That, again, is another extremely difficult uh, situation. I, I believe that what can uh, assist that, what can alleviate that potential, and it is a major problem, is to actually, firstly, always do things in an appropriate and sensitive way. Okay. Um, but one is clearly thinking they're doing it sensitively and appropriately, but maybe that's not the way the other, the senior person is seeing it. So you've got to look at it from their eyes. I think the second thing is to provide factual and detailed answers or suggestions or comments. There's little point in saying, no, I don't want to do that, or no, I can't do that, or look, I'm great, if you don't give some backup, some suggestion, some facts. So, so I think it's a matter of putting your case forward in the best possible light. You've, you've got to stand up for yourself. And what the booklet says is, there are a range of things you can do to, to, to improve your research career, but you've got to do them. Yep, you've got to stand up for yourself. It's a competitive environment, and if you want to do as well as you can, then it's up to you to push yourself forward. But it has to be appropriate, and it has to be sensitive, but ideally backed with facts, and, and the, 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 if you like, the, um, the comments and reputations of others. There's nothing like having a senior person say something positive about you rather than just saying it yourself. Which gets back to, again, the mentoring and the supervisor and so on. So it's, m much of this is not one specific answer to these questions, and they're very good questions, but again, it's the, the holistic approach to all of the questions. And when an early career researcher is working together with a more uh, established researcher, what should be their role in getting funding for their research? Certainly, again, um, the, quite, quite often the, the, the early career researcher might be involved in a lot of the preparation, a lot of the background, a lot of the literature searching. They may do a lot of the work and that's appropriate and it's a good training for them and so on. What needs to happen early on, probably before you even start the work, is for the early career researcher to say, well, What's going to, who's going to be the order of the authors, or the applicants in this case? Um, and, you know, literally in a polite way, what am I going to get out of it? Why am I doing this? And basically then the answer may be, well, and I've seen this happen in, in my situations when I've been a, 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 a funder, when I've been giving out public funding money in research councils, that the grant is often more likely to be successful if the early career, research, early career researcher is not listed on the front page as a PI or CI, but they then assist the preparation or do the preparation of the application, but then benefit from all the, the value and the, 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 the kudos that comes from being involved in the funding mechanism. Now, they're not listed as, a, as, a, as, a, as an applicant, and it is not their grant. So, so that would be a, a challenge. But the, de the, 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 the positive then is, the senior person who, who gets the grant then has the, the, um, the leadership capacity to hand on the running, the, the profile, the activity of the grant to the early career researcher who gets the kudos and the glory out of publications and that sort of thing. And then after the grant's finishing or near completion, they are then building up their track record to actually get their own grant. It is a real dilemma these days because in a competitive environment, 
having an early career researcher on an application may not be the best for the grant. And I'm a believer in getting the grant and then benefiting the early career researcher in that aspect, that way. In your booklet you repeatedly uh, mentioned people should plan their career. That's really important that people need to plan their career. But sometimes things obviously do not go as planned. So at what point should an early career researcher be flexible and decide to change plans? Yes, I do think, and when I say in the, in, the, in the booklet about planning, I think one needs to say, where do I want to be in three years' time? Where do I want to be in five years' time? Where do I want to be in ten years' time? And I think one needs to ask those questions yesterday. You need to know that now. Am I happy just to stay here? Am I happy, do I want to get a fellowship? Do I want to do teaching? Do I want to get into this research and so on? So I think at least whatever your plan, one needs a plan. Plans, as you say, rightly, things change, grants don't come about, publications, unfortunately, don't always get accepted and so on. So I think there's a, an area where one should give it your best shot. And by an example here, I would, I would use what I call heart on sleeve type research. It's actually things that people are passionate about. It is their passion. But if your passion is not going to be funded by any government agency, if your passion is not going to get you publications in high profile journals, then it really is what some people might describe in a negative sense as, as hobby research. It's things you want to do that are potentially very socially worthwhile, but if nobody's going to fund them, then you have to accept that you'll be doing it by yourself, on your own, potentially for a very long time. So th there probably isn't any particular point at which I say, okay, I'm not going to do that. But there must come a time, and I, I think it, it needs to be one that, okay, in three years' time I'm going to do this, in five years' time I'd like to be there. And then after four years or after six years you say, well, I didn't make that, but what are the reasons? Why didn't I? Now, if you can, if you can get there in seven rather than five, that's fine. But if, it, if it's a point of, well, I haven't made it in three, haven't made it in five, haven't made it you know, in, in seven, then you've got two choices. You either keep doing it, knowing that eventually you'll probably end up where you are now, doing hobby research or, or whatever in the nicest possible way, or you might change your direction, move in with a bigger team, uh, do another job, get a fellowship, and actually try and keep moving your profile along. And only the individual can make that decision. So very often it is most admirable to get a permanent job, but the competition for such jobs is often very hard. So um, what should an early career researcher do to stand out for such a job? Yep. Uh, I actually greatly valued my time teaching. I was a professor uh, who taught uh, first year biology to 300 students in a class. Um, I gave you know, walk-in lectures and, and greatly appreciated it. So I, I highly value teaching. But to get a full-time permanent continuing academic position these days, and I'm certainly not downplaying the value of high quality teaching. It is very worthwhile. But it is, I believe, more efficient and effective to get some really good high quality publications out of your PhD and early postdocs and then get into some teaching rather than to devote a lot of your time to teaching that's not necessarily going to stand you in good stead in the future. Once you get into an academic position, a continuing academic position, and there is a fair bit of teaching involved, it's extremely difficult to find the time to do the research to, to, to build your research profile. So my suggestion to that question would be to try and get as many high quality publications as you can, as soon as you can early in your career, because it builds a foundation. Certainly some people are fortunate enough to actually get a permanent academic role. That then tends to be based around undergraduate teaching. And once you're in that system, unless one wants to devote their career to high quality teaching, and that in itself is a very valuable exercise, but here we're talking about research, then I think you're much better off getting a high profile, high quality research um, activity as early as you can, and that will then stand you in good stead to actually get a permanent position later on. For to stand out, it is also important to have a good curriculum vitae. Uh, do you think it is bad to have a short curriculum vitae? It's not necessarily bad. In fact, what I think is bad is a much longer curriculum vitae that 
has inaccuracies, um, irrelevancies and things that just don't count. It's much better to have a shorter, succinct, defined, precise, accurate CV, even if it's only one page. And in a lot of early career research workshops I give uh, around the world, I highlight and I, I get, before I go, I get their CVs and some of them are sort of five or 10 pages. And by the time I finish making suggestions, they're down to one page, but it's succinct, it's high quality stuff. Assessors would much rather prefer to see a one page specific, um, but detailed, accurate CV of five publications rather than something that's six or seven pages that has material that's not that important, um, that doesn't keep saying, oh, you're a faculty board. You know, you've got to stand out from the crowd and it's much better to get your message across succinctly, quickly, but accurately. And so I don't see anything wrong with a one page CV. Um, I'd much prefer that than a six page CV, five and a half pages of which were irrelevancies and inaccuracies. So could you give an example of something that should definitely not be on someone's CV? Yes, absolutely. Uh, unsuccessful grant applications, okay? Unsuccessful papers. Um, now, you may put that in an academic sense if your department head is saying, well, what have you done in the last year? You might want to put down, well, I've applied for two unsuccessful grants, but that's only internal. You never put that down on your public CV. Okay, that, that's one. There are quite a number of others. Um, there are clear and distinct reasons for conference presentations, for posters, for, for books, for journal articles, for book chapters. But again, they should be clear and distinct, not all made to look like journal publications. And so those sort of things as well. There are a number of them, but, but they're the, probably the two major ones. Make it accurate. And if it's a conference presentation, that's fantastic. Make it look like a, under a heading that says conference presentations, but never put down unsuccessful outcomes. What would be your advice to an early career researcher to achieve a good work-life balance? Yes, that's a, a challenge. It depends on where you are, as in your research culture. It depends on the research discipline and it also I guess it depends on gender, it depends on one's personal background. What some people's idea of a work-life balance is, is clearly not what other people consider is a work-life balance. I really can't give a specific answer to that question, but what I can say is it's essential that an individual gives it serious thought and comes up with their own answer. Um, uh, it's not up for me to say, uh, I mean, when I did my postdoc, I was fortunate enough to have a Fulbright scholarship and I would work seven or eight days in a row and I would have one or two off. Um, some people do that normally, as a matter of course. Others tend to, to be able to get away with a couple of days and so on. So it, it depends. Clearly there are family relationships, there are a range of other personal uh, indicators, personal criteria that one needs to consider. But whatever you decide, whatever one decides, it needs to be a decision that they need to make.